This man right here is one of Korea's last remaining master potters. His name is Yu Hyo Ung, and he specializes in glazed ceramics that date back to the Shida dynasty around 2000 years ago. And he still uses pretty similar methods, handmade tools, and a pottery wheel that's powered by his legs. We visited him in Gyeongju and managed to get a private demonstration on how to make a vase and a bottle. He then showed us around back where he has a traditional Korean style kiln. Then he took us into a shop where he showed us all the little different things he makes, and you could see him get excited showing us all the little details and quirks of his pieces. We had a look around and also bought some stuff, but overall super interesting and worth checking out in Gyeongju if you're in Korea. We stayed in this Korean Hanok house in the ancient capital of South Korea. We've been wanting to do this for so long now and the opportunity to do it finally came up so you know we jumped at the chance to stay in one. The house itself was basically made of wood, mud and rice paper but with some mod inclusions like electricity and linoleum flooring. There were even some birds living in the roof tiles. The rooms were set up in a line with the main living space in the center with two rooms on one side and one room on the other and of course we got to sleep on the floor. I remember as a child visiting our Korean relatives who lived in something very similar albeit not as fancy by Hanok standards but sitting on the wooden decking listening to the sounds of the birds and harmonies walking by it was easy to forget about a few of the things that have been troubling me at the time. We hit the local high street that night for dinner and to explore before heading back, and despite the paper thin walls and the swarms of mosquitoes outside, I slept pretty well with little to no mosquito bites. And I woke up extra early the next morning because I specifically wanted to make and drink coffee out on the wooden decking, and it was everything I imagined it would be. This is a halabong, or as Americans call them, sumo oranges, which I don't know why, but in Korea these are called halabong, and it's basically like a giant mandarin not an orange. Right now we're vacationing in Jeju, which is an island off the bottom of Korea. It's like, this is the only place in Korea where these are grown. And so of course, if you're here in the right season, you've got to try them. So grab like a five kilogram box of them for just under $30. And these are honestly the most delicious mandarin orange things that you can get. To peel them, you just got to pop off this top bit. It peels super easy, just like a mandarin. They just look like a giant mandarin or satsuma or tangerine, whatever you want to call them. I think these are seedless too, so show them. They're so sweet. But I heard that they, what they do is they pick these and they let them sit for anywhere from like up to a month to let the sweetness really develop. So these are really sweet. So in Korea, they make all sorts of products with these like chocolate, drinks, uh, ice creams. I don't know if they make chung. Maybe that's something we can do, but I don't know if I'll be here when it's still season for these but if you're in Jeju at the right time I highly recommend you come and get some of these. This is probably one of the most unique places I visited in Korea. This is Namhae German town right at the bottom of South Korea. It was built in the 60s as a place for Koreans returning from Germany. These days it's more of a tourist attraction with thousands of people visiting when I was there. There's a bunch of restaurants and beer houses and even some local breweries. We sat down at what seemed like the most popular restaurant and we got some pork knuckle, schnitzel and hot dog. Food was pretty good and the price was pretty good as well and the beer was okay. Overall it was a pretty cool place to visit if you have a car to drive and the surrounding areas are stunning too. One of the main reasons I came to Korea was to come visit my parents and my sister, obviously. But another big reason I came to visit Korea is because my parents, while I've been in England, have went and bought themselves a farm. So I thought it'd be fun to give you guys just a quick tour of the farm. So out here in the main field, we've got like hundreds of dechu, which is Chinese dates. They kind of just look like little apples. Usually in the stores, you get these dried, but when they're fresh, they taste amazing. They taste, they taste so sweet like apples. And so there's quite a few fig trees back here. You can see a fig there. Move into the greenhouse. They got grapes growing above us. Some mint. This is kale. These are meter beans. I'm not sure what those are. This is the giant basil plant. You can see the size of that basil plant. It's huge. Cauliflowers, but I'm not sure if these are growing very well. Here's another bean plant. Some tropical plants in the back. An aubergine or eggplant. This might be the European kind. Asparagus, but it's in its first year, so they just let it grow out. This is gennip, which is perilla. You might know from Korean barbecue. And over here, they've got passion fruit. Here's a recap of my trip to Jeju this past weekend. And if you don't know what Jeju is, it's an island off the south of South Korea, which is a popular vacation spot for Koreans. So day one, we landed in Jeju, got our rental car, grabbed some McDonald's drive through and then picked up a friend. We checked out this black sand beach, which had this cool inlet where you could rent boats and loads of these stacked rocks. Then we went out to grab dinner and checked out some buskers on the way. We had black pork, a super popular meat in Jeju and had some cold spicy nudes. Then we went to a cafe to grab some cakes, a matcha latte and watch people set off fireworks on the beach. Day two, we started off with a fish brunch. We had grilled fish, mackerel stew, seaweed soup and soy sauce crab. Next stop was Ocelok Tea Museum to check out the green tea fields and the cafe where we got some green tea and desserts. Then we walked around some cool giant grass fields. Day three we started the day off at a cafe on the coast where we got coffee and some pastries. Then we hiked up Songsan Ulchulbong but really it was just stairs all the way up. We then hit up a forest which I forget the name of, walked around for an hour or so before we headed back into the city. In the city we went to the Jeju five day market because we just happened to be there on the right day which was huge and got some tteokbokki, odeng and sundae. We roused around a bit, bought some oranges before dropping off our car and flying back to Seoul. 
This place is like the Tsukiji market of Korea. It's called Noryangjin, and it's a popular spot if you want to eat some fresh seafood in Seoul. However, there's a system in place if you want to eat some fresh seafood. On the ground floor, you'll find the main marketplace, with hundreds of stalls selling all sorts of seafood. That is, pre-COVID, now only a handful of stalls are open and closed by 9pm. Once you buy your seafood from a stall on the ground floor, someone will guide you to a restaurant where they'll prepare all your fresh seafood for you. All they charge is a seating fee, drinks, and any extra food you order from them. I went with my sister, and together we got this plate of mixed sashimi with mostly local fish, but they also added some salmon. We also got some quote-unquote live octopus, it's actually completely dead, but still wriggling. Then we bought some fresh prawns, which the restaurant grilled for us, and to round it all off, a spicy soup made from the remains of one of the fishes we had for sashimi. This is the best beef you've probably never heard of. This is Korean hanu beef, which is only really sold in Korea. This is the highest grade of hanu beef you can get. For 900 grams, this cost about $120 for various cuts. We're eating this at Majang Meat Market, which is like the center of the Hanu beef trade. The way it works is you buy your meat at any one of the dozen butcher shops in the market. Then you make your way to a local restaurant where they'll supply the grills, the drinks, and the side dishes. If you spend enough as well, most butchers will throw in some freebies. Here we got some raw Hanu beef, which the restaurant played for us as soon as we sat down. And of course you gotta cook this Korean BBQ style on an open grill using real wood charcoal. So I recently ate at the fanciest Korean Hanu beef restaurant I've ever been to. Some close friends of ours invite us to eat with them at Born and Bread in Majangdong in Seoul because they managed to get a reservation. And they only serve the best quality Korean Hanu beef. We had a private room where our own personal chef grilled everything for us and I couldn't even count how many courses there was, but it was a lot. I don't remember the last time I had this much meat in me. Some of the highlights of the dinner was this Hanu Katsu Sando, tenderloin, and this pho made with Hanu beef. And because I'd recently turned 25, they brought out my dessert with its own special plating, which was vanilla ice cream topped with some olive oil, rosemary, and a side of some cake. Who knew vanilla ice cream and olive oil would go so well? 